Hi everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about geophysical properties of standing waters. Okay, so what, what's the very first thing I want to talk about is temperature. And temperature is very, very important because it impacts oxygen content and something we call biological oxygen demand. As the temperature of a body of water like a lake increases, the creatures that live in that lake, since most of them are endotherms, their metabolism is going to increase. And so as their metabolism increases, what's going to happen is that they're going to need more oxygen. And so they start using more of the oxygen that's dissolved in the water. Now, as that temperature increases, dissolved oxygen content is also going to be decreasing at the same time because warm water holds less dissolved oxygen or any other gas than colder water. Have you ever poured yourself a glass of hot water out of the sink and it looks cloudy and you might go, ooh, what is that that I'm, I'm I can't drink that water. I can't look at it. It's dirty. Well, it's not dirty. What's happening is all the gases that were trapped in that water while it was inside the pipes of your house uh, are suddenly being released as soon as the pressure or the confines of the pipe are being taken away. It's sort of like taking the top off of a soda and having all the carbon dioxide fizz out. It's the same principle. And if you let the water sit long enough, all of those gases will dissipate out of that, out of that glass of hot water. So that just demonstrates to you how oxygen and other gases can't stay in hotter water. So again, as that water temperature rises in a lake, we're going to see less and less oxygen being held in the water. So the significance of this is that as the need of those organisms for oxygen increases because their metabolism is increasing, the availability of oxygen is decreasing because the water can't hold it in solution. And so a lot of times that results in fish kills. And so you see that a lot of times uh, during certain parts of the year where there's a big fish kill on a lake. The next characteristic I want to talk about is the nature of the bottom. In other words, what is the bottom of the lake like? Well, because lakes are sort of like big holes, they capture things coming from the land that surrounds them. And so the lakes are going to be probably laden with detritus, and all detritus is, is just non-living organic matter in various forms. It could be leaves, it could be parts of leaves, and it could be <clears throat> the leaves when they're broken down into tiny, tiny pieces by organisms as they eat them. Now, if the light reaches the bottom, then that means plants can grow there because plants need light to grow. And that's incredibly important because those plants will provide habitat for organisms and they'll produce oxygen that goes into the water and provides oxygen for those animals to do their metabolism, to do their cellular respiration. If there's no light, then we won't have plants. So lakes that are deep enough where light doesn't penetrate, they may not have plants in that part of the lake. So very important concept to keep in mind. We'll come back to this again. Color is another thing that, we'll, that uh, you look at, and it's caused by suspended and dissolved solids. If the water is green like the picture here, then probably you have phytoplankton in that lake. If it turns kind of a yellowish color, well, you might have dead phytoplankton in that lake. And if it's brown, well, you probably have suspended clays in that lake, um, probably from rain events bringing in uh, clay through erosion. A related characteristic is something called turbidity. And turbidity is just cloudiness that's due to suspended solids. Uh, what are those solids? Well, some of them could be caused by organic material that's washed in. And it could be living things even. If you have enough um, enough algae and enough uh, phytoplankton, it, it might uh, cause the water to look cloudy. More times than not, it's inorganics, it's silt or clay that have washed in uh, due to a rain event that's caused erosion. 
Another characteristic is transparency. Again, uh, sort of related to, to all of these. Um, it's, it's how well light travels through the water. Remember, we talked earlier about uh, if the light can get to the bottom, you can have plants. And so transparency is going to let us understand where plants might be. So it is going to indicate to us uh, how many suspended solids are in that water. So to measure it, we're going to use this device called a Secchi disk. And the Secchi disk is lowered in, into the water until it reaches a depth where it disappears. And once it disappears, you're going to raise it up a little bit until it reappears. So you're going to try to fine tune it to figure out exactly where that depth is. And you're going to record that depth. And this depth actually is going to cor correspond to something we call the compensation depth. And that's just the depth at which the amount of uh, respiration and the amount of photosynthesis are equal to one another. Uh, in other words, it's where the amount of oxygen that living things are taking up is equal to the amount of uh, oxygen that's being made by things like plankton and plants. So here is a diagram showing a, a Secchi disk being used. And you can see it's just this flat round disk and it typically has alternating quarters of black and white which helps you see it gives a little bit of contrast so if I have a low amount of algae in the water or if I have a low amount of uh, suspended solids then that light can penetrate much deeper and so my Secchi disk reading will be much deeper if I have a high algal content high phytoplankton or I have a high amount of uh, suspended solids then the light won't penetrate nearly as far and so my Secchi disk reading will be much uh, much lower and so uh, so that's what we're doing we're trying to measure how far that light can penetrate and so here's a picture of a Secchi disk and you can see that it's on a on a line and if you look at the picture on the left you'll see some marks on the rope that those marks give you an idea that how far down uh, you've lowered that uh, you've lowered that disc. Uh, so that that's a Secchi disc. All right, so now let's put it all together uh, and see how all these things interact with one another within a lake. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at are lake zones. Now there's a whole group of lake zones that that are all uh, characterized by temperature changes and each one of these zones has a uh, different characteristics that are unique then we're going to look at light penetration and, and how we can classify different zones based on light penetration and then we're going to finish up talking about lake overturn uh, what is lake overturn it's it's happens twice a year in the temperate regions and it brings nutrients back to the top that have sunk down to the bottom. At the beginning, I talked about how you've got to think of a lake as being kind of a big hole. And things wash in from around uh, the lake, and, uh, and they, then they sink to the bottom. And the, a lot of those things are organic matter, and that's where we, things get their nutrients from. And they sink to the bottom where they're unavailable to, to life, because most of your living things are going to be at the surface. So we're going to see how lake overturn happens and talk about why it's important. So let's look at a classification by temperature. And when we say temperature, we're actually meaning temperature change. Now this is a lake that is in uh, summer stagnation and I hope you love my, my drawing here. So what happens during the summer is that the light heats up the water. But you have to remember through our discussion earlier that light doesn't penetrate all the way to the bottom in places. And so really what it's doing is it's heating up the surface. And so the bottom stays cold. And so you end up with this differential in density. And so we have the warmer water at the top and the colder water at the bottom. The top layer we call epilimnion, which means a pond, uh, sort of like an epidermis. Uh, the bottom layer is called the hypolimnion, and hypo means under. And then, of course, the metalimnion's in the middle. Meta means middle. So we classify it by temperature change. 
and you can actually lower a thermometer and find these regions very easily just by looking at temperature change. So, so the epilimnion and the hypolimnion are both characterized by a slow change in temperature. And what we mean by a slow change in temperature is that it's less than one degree Celsius for every meter depth you go down. In other words, you could start up here, maybe at the surface, and it might be 30. And if you go down to the next meter, it might be 29.5, okay? So, so you, that's how you do this, okay? Now, you're in the middle, in this area called metalimnion, we sometimes call the thermocline, because what you're gonna notice there is that there's an incredibly fast change and it could be greater than one degree Celsius per meter depth. And if you've ever gone swimming in a lake, you've probably experienced this. You jump into a lake and you try to see how deep the lake is and you go swimming down, and all of a sudden you hit this area where it gets really cold, really fast. What you've done is you just hit the thermocline. So because they have these drastic temperature differences, you have these three layers that form, and these three layers end up keeping the lake from mixing totally. And so you get these different conditions. At the top of the lake, at the, uh, the epilimnion, this is where most of your life is. Let's see, I'm gonna change that and say, this is where your life is, where your plants are, your phytoplankton and everything. And so they're gonna be photosynthesizing and they're gonna be producing a high amount of oxygen, okay? And, and that's where a lot of your animals are going to be because, frankly, they can't live without oxygen, okay? Now, down here at the bottom, because these layers are all stratified, they're not going to mix. We're going to see instead that we have a low O2, okay? So why do we have a low O2 down there? Well, first of all, there's nothing down there photosynthesizing, but also all your organic matter that we talked about earlier has sunk to the bottom, and the bacteria are decomposing it, and as they decompose it, they're gonna produce a lot of CO2. And it's, the CO2 is gonna go up because there's no plants down there to use it in photosynthesis. You're also gonna have all these other nutrients like nitrates and phosphates. And then you have this thing happening with your pH. Because the CO2 is going up, that, that CO2 sometimes gets converted to carbonic acid. And so that, remember your pH scale, low means acid. So your pH is going down, down there. So that's classification by temperature in the summertime. Again, hep, hep, epilimnion, slow temperature change at the surface, full of life, high O2, hypolimnion at the bottom, uh, Lots of organic matter, so low O2 because of decomposition, high CO2, and high nutrients down there. And don't forget, don't forget these temperature changes, okay, because they're going to dictate uh, where these zones are. They're going to tell you where they are. Fast change for that thermocline, okay? And we should be able to give you a list of, of temperatures, and you should be able to figure that out. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, now we have classification by light. And there's an awful lot of information here that we're really just not going to get into. Uh, the main thing I want to point out to you that, that you need to know about light is this whole upper area here. This whole area where light is able to penetrate, okay? And so we have two zones up here that you need to be concerned with. And one of them is the literal zone, and that's where light is able to penetrate the water and get all the way to the bottoms. And here we have it right there. And because of that, you get plant growth. Um, and then once you get away from shore far enough, suddenly you get to a point where the light can no longer penetrate to the bottom. And at that point, we have what is called the limnetic zone. And those are really the two zones that you really need to concern yourself with in this diagram. This whole area up here in the top, because it gets plenty of light, you're going to get a lot of photosynthesis happening up there. And because there's a lot of photosynthesis happening, you're going to have a lot of life up there. All right? So that's classification by light. 
So all of this brings us to the annual lake cycle, what we call lake overturn. Okay, so what you have up here, let's get my, this is what we just looked at uh, two slides ago, summer conditions. You have an epilimnion, you have a thermocline, and you have a hypolimnion. And because they don't mix, because they're different densities, the only mixing that happens is here on the surface, this mixing when the wind blows. But it's not going down to the bottom and getting all of that, all that the nutrients that have sunk to the bottom. So what's going to happen? How does that happen? Well, it happens in the fall when the temperature starts to drop on the epilimnion. And eventually what you see are these layers all disappear. And in the fall, when all of the lake is the same exact temperature, when the wind blows, it now can circulate that water all the way to the bottom. So two things happen. One is that we bring up nutrients from the bottom to the surface, which makes all the organisms happy up there. And oxygen that's at the surface is taken down to the bottom. So we're seeing everything turn over and we're seeing everybody getting a little bit of what they need. And sometimes those conditions are so drastic that you end up with algal blooms on lakes uh, in, in the fall. In fact, if you go to Waller Mill, Waller Mill is uh, used as a, um, as a water source for Williamsburg. And so they have a water treatment plant on that lake. They will sometimes treat the water with, uh, with chemicals to keep the algae from growing uh, at a tremendous rate. And that way it won't clog their screens where they have the water uptake. Um, then if you live in a region where the, where the water will actually freeze in the wintertime, that freezing prevents that lake from mixing again. Obviously, it's kind of hard to, for the wind to mix that water uh, if there's ice on the surface of the lake. But then some, springtime comes, the water starts to heat up again. And as it heats up, we're going to see a point sometime in the spring where all the water temperature is about the same throughout the water column. And those days when the wind blows again, we're going to see a cycling of those nutrients. We're going to, the, the water is going to mix. It's going to bring the nutrients up from the bottom. It's going to carry some oxygen down to the, to the bottom. And so we see that, that uh, again, life tends to get really happy at this time. You might see lots of algae growing because of the sudden influx of things like nitrates and phosphates. So that's lake overturn. You see it in the temperate regions of, of the world, and it's extremely important in a lake. So those are some of the properties of lakes and standing waters. Make sure to watch the following videos on the page because they explain probably better than I did uh, some of these characteristics. On the next page, you will look at the characteristics of flowing water. Take care.